the members of this subcommittee and uh, our subcommittee on water, oceans, and wildlife will now come to order. We're meeting today to examine the president's proposed fiscal year 2022 budget for agencies under this committee's, uh, the subcommittee's jurisdiction under Rule 4F, any oral opening statements at this hearing are limited to the chairman and the ranking member. This allows us to hear from our witnesses sooner and helps members keep their schedules. I therefore ask unanimous consent that all other members' opening statements be made part of the hearing record if they're submitted to the clerk by 5 p.m. today or the close of the hearing, whichever comes first. And hearing no objection, it is so ordered. Without objection, the chair may also declare a recess subject to the call of the chair. As described in the notice, statements, documents, or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository at the following email address, hnrcdocs at mail.house.gov. Members physically present should provide a hard copy for staff to distribute by email. Additionally, please note, as always, uh, members are responsible for their own microphones, as with our fully in-person meetings. Uh, in this hybrid meeting, uh, members who are joining us online can be muted by staff, uh, but only to avoid inadvertent background noise. Pursuant to Rule 3L and the latest guidance from the attending physician, anyone present in the hearing room today must wear a mask covering their mouth and nose if they are not fully vaccinated, or if they're uncomfortable telling us whether they're fully vaccinated. So. If you are not wearing a mask in the hearing room today, you are representing to this committee that you are fully vaccinated. It's my hope that with everyone's cooperation, we can protect the safety of members and staff and the families that they return to at home. The committee does have masks available for anyone who needs one. Finally, members or witnesses experiencing technical problems should inform committee staff immediately. I will now recognize myself for five minutes. So we're here today for an oversight hearing on the administration's fiscal 2022 budget requests for Bureau of Reclamation, Fish and Wildlife Service, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the U.S. Geological Survey. These agencies testifying today are responsible for some very important things, delivering water to millions of people across the West, developing data that helps operate our water systems, understanding changes to our climate and environment, making our coastal communities more resilient, and conserving and enhancing our nation's biodiversity, fish, and wildlife resources. Today's hearing gives us an opportunity to discuss what the administration is doing to address and plan for the threat posed by climate change to our water supply, our native fish and wildlife, and our ecosystems, and the many communities that depend on these natural resources. I especially look forward to hearing more today about proposed and planned drought response activities now and in the upcoming fiscal year. Federal drought response is essential as extreme drought conditions intensify across the West. 95% of the West is currently in drought. Reservoirs in the Colorado River Basin continue to fall to record lows, plummeting to levels that will likely soon trigger the first ever shortage declaration in that basin. And it's not just the Colorado Basin and the Central Valley Project. Closer to home in my North Coast California district, I have communities that are preparing for the likelihood of running out of water and making plans to bring in modular desalination units. Water supplies are strained across California and iconic salmon runs are being devastated. Temperatures have climbed as much as 17 degrees above normal in the Pacific Northwest, shattering previous records. And in the Klamath River Basin, it's especially dire. Tribes, farmers, and communities in the districts that ranking member Benz and I represent are dealing with some of the most challenging drought impacts in the country. So I look forward to hearing more about Reclamation's strategy to use the legal authorities and the funding provided by Congress to respond to these conditions. At today's hearing, we'll also discuss administration plans to use several new water management tools that Congress provided last December, including several programs the administration specifically requested funding for in this budget request. For example, we'll discuss plans for the newly established aging infrastructure account the Aquatic Ecosystem Restoration Program, new Water Smart Grant Program authorities, amendments to Reclamation's Cooperative Watershed Management Program, and new authorities for improved snowpack measurement. Tackling climate change requires that we simultaneously address the current threats, such as extreme drought, wildfires, and heat waves, while maintaining systems that are going to be critical to avoiding even worse impacts in coming years. 
So alongside reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, uh, we need to talk about nature-based solutions as a key tool to mitigate climate change. Our nation's natural capital can sequester and store carbon and provide critical services that are often overlooked. Blue carbon ecosystems, for example, protect coasts and shorelines, support livelihoods, and sequester 27 million teragrams of carbon. A teragram is an awful lot of carbon. Of course, our emissions right now far exceed what nature can sustain, and the adverse impacts of climate change continue to hammer our ecosystems and wildlife. So I'm pleased to see a new emphasis on climate change mitigation and ecosystem monitoring throughout the budgets that we'll be discussing here today. These proposals are timely. A recent report issued by the IPCC emphasized the important role of ecosystems in sustaining our natural carbon fluxes. Climate change cannot be addressed without simultaneous action to resolve the biodiversity crisis. And as that report highlights, these systems are complex. So addressing climate change requires a multifaceted approach, and many of the necessary tools highlighted in the budgets before us today are responsive to that. Both NOAA and Fish and Wildlife Service are prioritizing climate monitoring and protections for carbon sequestering ecosystems and habitats. USGS is requesting, um, also requests these important priorities along with sorely needed biodiversity research and ecosystem services assessments. I look forward to hearing more from our witnesses and understanding more about these efforts. There is a real urgency to this work. This year, we've already seen the highest levels of carbon dioxide on record. Nearly the entire Western United States is in drought. Hundreds of people have died from extreme heat waves in the Pacific Northwest and wildfires threaten numerous American communities. Climate change is here, and it is relentless. So we have to be relentless as well. This subcommittee stands ready to work with the administration, and we look forward to today's discussion on how federal budget plans can best advance solutions to tackle the climate crisis. I'll now recognize Ranking Member Bentz for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for holding this hearing. It's important that Congress exercise its oversight authorities on the executive branch. One of the ways to do that is to have these agencies explain their budgets and their missions, and that's what we are doing here today. This subcommittee has a broad swath of jurisdictions shared with the agencies before us. These agencies, the Bureau of Reclamation, the U.S. Geological Survey, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration impact the lives of Americans daily. They have a direct impact on many of my constituents. And in fact, all four agencies have a say in how water is managed or mismanaged as many believe in the Klamath Basin mentioned earlier by the chair where the Endangered Species Act and other laws continue to have tremendous effects on the way life up and down that basin uh, is lived. Let me give you a snapshot. The Bureau of Reclamation owns the Klamath Irrigation Project. The USGS measures water quantity and quality throughout the basin for various purposes. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Refuge manages the upper Klamath Lake and other nearby waters for two endangered suckerfish species. And the National Marine Fisheries Service under NOAA manages Klamath and other river flows for endangered coho and other salmon species. I know everyone will be shocked, but sometimes these agencies have a hard time communicating and in some cases conflict with one another, especially when it relates to single species management. And catastrophic drought, uh, such as that which is taking place right now, makes matters exponentially more complicated. Hundreds of millions of dollars have been poured into fixing the climate situation over the last 20 years through both Democrat and Republican administrations and Democrat and Republican Congresses, but I don't know one person who has said that such, such efforts have succeeded. Many irrigators served by the Climate Project are rightfully upset that they have the first ever zero allocation of water while there seems to be an abundance of water in the upper Klamath Lake reserved for two suckerfish species, uh, which I mentioned before. And tribal communities are suffering as well. Certainly, disaster money uh, will be utilized in the short term, but that is a mere band-aid on what could be a fatal wound to many in the basin. People, including the agencies before us today, have come to the table to help find lasting solutions so that everyone gets better together and has a future, I hope, in the Western United States. The status quo isn't working here, and I venture to say that it isn't working in a lot of other places in Oregon and the Northwest, and in fact, the Western United States was just being pummeled uh, by drought. In Oregon, the catastrophic bootleg fire and other places in the West are uh, uh, 
uh, growing dramatically in size. And in fact, if you look out the window over the past couple of days right here in Washington, D.C., you'd see parts of Oregon passing by in the form of uh, smoke. Uh, these uh, agencies and we here in Congress can certainly do better and must do better. While most of the West is burning rapidly or running out of water, I want to hear what these agencies are doing in the short term and long term when it comes to drought and species management. These agencies have an opportunity before us today to engage in visionary thinking or continuing to think in the short term, which has had amount to rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. With that, I thank the chairman for this hearing and I look forward to hearing from our members and the witnesses before us today. I thank the ranking member, and I understand that the ranking member of the full committee, uh, Mr. Westerman, is joining us and would like to uh, give us an opening statement. So uh, if, if we've got him with us online, I will recognize ranking member Westerman for five minutes. Oh, wait, he's right here. <laughs> thank you, Chairman Hoffman. This is even better. Yeah, snuck in here on you. I didn't see you come in, so yeah. welcome. Good to see you in person and not on a, not on a grid. Good to be with Good you. To be Take it person. away. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing. And, uh, you know, from the Pond Creek Wildlife Refuge in my district and the nearby Red Snapper Fishery in the Gulf of Mexico to Alaska's Longline Fishing Industry to California's Central Valley Water Project and the Chesapeake Bay, the four agencies before us today have an impact on the daily lives of all Americans, uh, either directly or indirectly. The agencies play a vital role in our recreational pursuits, including hunting and fishing. They deliver water to farms so Americans have access to fruits, nuts, vegetables, and other foods, and they provide jobs to our communities. But what they give, they can also take away. Government fiat can quickly replace abundance uh, and replace that with scarcity. This is why it's so important that Congress have oversight on these agencies. We could discuss literally hundreds of matters today, but I want to focus on just a few in the short time that I have. Uh, testimonies by the Fish and Wildlife Service and NOAA talk about the 30 by 30 initiative, which has now been rebranded by what the administration now calls, quote, the America the Beautiful Initiative, unquote. Other than a catchy bumper sticker slogan, this effort still remains largely undefined. We believe that conservation, not preservation of our natural resources is the best policy and that the American people deserve transparency and clarity on this issue. Next, Noah's testimony barely touches on fisheries management, particularly red snapper. The Center for Sport Fishing Policy, which is composed of recreational anglers and related industries, recently gave the agency a red flag due to the agency's failure to incorporate state data on how it counts fish. The five Gulf states have vastly improved access to our red snapper fishery and have led the way on fish counting innovation, but NOAA seems to be a boat lost at sea when it comes to working with the states. Next, more than 95% of the West is under severe drought. While we can't make it rain or snow at this point, we can take proactive steps to avoid the next drought. The administration should provide a long-term strategy for doing this, not just pave the way to the next disaster. I and my Republican colleagues offer an all of the above approach when it comes to water, starting with water storage uh, that it was advanced by the last administration. Finally, uh, the Biden administration is threatening rural America with potential future listings of the greater sage grouse and the lesser prairie chicken. These decisions will reverse millions of dollars of successful conservation efforts and will shut the door on future investment. Additionally, this administration is ignoring science on northern spotted owl critical habitat, seeking again to lock up more land across the West. The end result of this will be more destruction as this locked up land will eventually be engulfed in catastrophic wildfires like we're seeing today. I have concerns with how the administration's approach thus far seems to be just overturning many of the past administration's efforts. That's really not a plan. The ping pong approach continually fails to provide certainty to people, species, and our environment. I'm hoping today that we will have a dialogue on how we can work collaboratively towards a better future. And I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Westerman. We'll now hear witness testimony. And under committee rules, I ask the witnesses to limit their oral statements to five minutes, but your entire statement will appear in the hearing record. Uh, when you begin the timer, we'll start counting down. It turns orange when you have one minute remaining. 
And I recommend that uh, members and witnesses joining us remotely use the grid view so that they can lock the timer on their screen. Uh, after the witnesses complete testimony, please remember to mute yourself to avoid any inadvertent background noise. I'll allow all the witnesses to testify before we bring it back to the members for questioning. Uh, we will first hear from Mr. David Palumbo, Deputy Commissioner of Operations for the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, and next we'll hear from Dr. Don Klein, Associate Director of Water Resources at the U.S. Geological Survey. Then we will hear from uh, Mr. Stephen Gerton, Deputy Director for Program Management and Policy for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And finally, we'll hear from Dr. Richard Spinrad, the Undersecretary of Commerce for Oceans and Atmosphere, as well as the Administrator of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Palumbo to testify for five minutes. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Huffman, Ranking Member Benz, Ranking Member Westerman, and members of the subcommittee. I am David Palumbo, Deputy Commissioner of Operations, and I'm happy to be here to discuss the President's budget for the Bureau of Reclamation, alongside my partners with USGS, Fish and Wildlife Service, and NOAA. The Bureau of Reclamation is the largest supplier and manager of water in the nation, and the second largest producer of hydropower. Reclamation manages water for agricultural, municipal, and industrial uses, the environment, and provides flood control and recreation. Reclamation enjoys a close, bipartisan working relationship with both the subcommittee and the full committee. This relationship has helped us to address both longstanding and emerging challenges in the West. Many of these challenges will continue to require close cooperation and innovative solutions, addressing drought, climate change, and issues of equity and sustainability are essential and are, as are the continuing needs to secure, maintain, and modernize our nation's water infrastructure. To start, I'd like to acknowledge what is at the forefront of many members' minds, the significant, expansive, and persistent drought. It has been an extraordinarily dry year for much of the West. As you can see from the current U.S. Drought Monitor map, every state west of the 100th Meridian is experiencing some level of water stress with many of the 17 Western states experiencing extreme or exceptional drought. These dire hydrologic conditions have resulted in the need to make difficult decisions. Many farmers, tribes, stakeholders, and related communities have had to make significant sacrifices. This situation further highlights the need for extensive planning and work to make our infrastructure more resilient to withstand future water resource scarcity and variability as well as to maintain healthy ecosystems. Reclamation's priorities reflect this vital need through a commitment to drought planning and response activities, such as the seven basin states drought contingency plans and system conservation agreements. This budget request also acknowledges the need to continue to develop and deploy science-based drought and climate change adaptation strategies. Reclamation's water smart and science and technology programs directly contribute to these administration priorities. Reclamation also continues to emphasize its important role in renewable energy. The 40 million megawatt hours of clean energy we generate each year displaces over 18 million tons of carbon dioxide emissions and supports grid stability and other renewables like wind and solar power. Reclamation must also plan for the future of its infrastructure. Reclamation's dams and reservoirs, water conveyance systems, and power generating facilities serve as the water and power infrastructure backbone of the American West. However, much of this infrastructure is aging and in need of critical maintenance. BFSIS Dam in California, for example, which provides two million acre feet of water storage south of the Delta, is one of the most significant funding needs under Reclamation's dam safety program. Our fiscal year 2022 budget request includes pre-construction funding for the dam safety work and meanwhile, in December, we published the final feasibility report on further expanding the reservoir behind CISC to add 130,000 acre feet of new storage. And we're working with potential local cost partners to arrange for that project. However, it is not sufficient to address infrastructure needs without also considering economic inequities and the needs of underserved communities. As illustrated by the President's executive orders and the recently proposed American Jobs Plan, this administration is committed to generating broader economic opportunities and fostering greater social inclusion. 
Reclamation is establishing and rebuilding water infrastructure for underserved populations by ensuring that clean drinking water is reliably provided to all communities. Our budget includes funding for Reclamation's Native American Affairs Program to enhance our technical assistance to tribes and includes funding for Reclamation's Rural Water Program. The Bureau of Reclamation remains committed to working with Congress and our operating partners and stakeholders in executing our mission and responsibly planning for the future. Reclamation wants to play a meaningful role in the modernization of water and energy sectors of our nation. The challenges of drought and climate change demand such action and the need for broader economic development and more equitable outcomes do as well. I again thank the subcommittee and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Palumbo. The chair now recognizes Dr. Klein to testify for five minutes. Chairman Huffman, Ranking Member Benz, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the invitation to deliver this testimony regarding the fiscal year 2022 budget request for the Water Resources Missionary of the U.S. Geological Survey. The 2022 budget requests $1.6 billion for the USGS. This request recognizes the important role the nation's largest water, earth, and biological science and civilian mapping agency can play in tackling the climate crisis, while also supporting economic growth and security and informing resource management decisions across the U.S. For the Water Resources Mission Area, the budget requests $288.4 million. This includes $64.5 million for cooperative matching funds, which would allow the USGS to partner with nearly 1,600 local, state, regional, and tribal agencies to monitor and assess water in every state, protectorate, and territory. The USGS works with partners to monitor, assess, conduct targeted research, and deliver information on a wide range of water resources and conditions. The budget sustains national water monitoring networks, provides capacity to research quantity and quality limits on water availability, and supports the development of regional and national scale water models and model-based decision support tools. In 2022, the Water Resources Missionary would focus on delivering integrated water availability assessments, advancing USGS water observing systems, modernizing the USGS national water information system, and building integrated water prediction capabilities. These activities would be advanced through both USGS work nationwide, as well as targeted plans to intensively monitor and study selected integrated water science basins. So three of these basins have already been selected the Delaware River Basin, the Upper Colorado River Basin, and the Illinois River Basin. And a fourth basin, the Pacific Northwest, is to be selected at the beginning of FY 2022. In each basin, the USGS will be developing assessment and predictive methodologies and tools that can be expanded from the basin to the larger surrounding region and ultimately the nation. The 2022 budget invests in these efforts. Under our Water Availability New Science Program, the budget would enable the USGS to continue work on integrated water availability assessments in the Delaware River Basin and the Upper Colorado River Basin, and would allow the USGS to begin work in the Illinois River Basin. In addition, the USGS would continue to develop techniques to evaluate water availability, advance the models and infrastructure that support assessments, and deliver tools that resource managers can use to support resource planning. In FY 2022, efforts would focus on incorporating climate change and variability land use and land cover change, and socioeconomic drivers into our water prediction capabilities. The USGS would also enhance prediction capabilities related to the water availability impacts of climate-driven extreme events, such as drought, wildfire, and hurricanes. Through our groundwater and stream flow information program, the budget would maintain our core monitoring networks while also allowing us to continue to enhance monitoring infrastructure through the next generation water observing system. Efforts would be advanced across the three integrated water science basins, as well as a fourth basin in the Pacific Northwest once it's selected. The USGS would also continue advancements in storm tide sensors and rapidly deployable gauges to facilitate the availability of more data prior to, during, and after water hazard events. Under our National Water Quality Program, the budget would support activities to assess water quality factors such as salinity and temperature in the Delaware River Basin, groundwater salinity and selenium in the Upper Colorado River Basin, and developing a framework for assessing the impacts of nutrients on water availability in the Illinois River Basin. In addition, the USGS will continue to invest in research that is needed to understand water quality processes so that knowledge can be incorporated into our national and regional scale models. Lastly, in FY22, 
our Water Resources Research Act program will continue to plan, facilitate, and coordinate water resources research, education, and information transfer in partnership with the state water resources research institutes. Annual base grants will support undergraduate and graduate students in their education and training, while competitive grants will support research on water issues that are regional or interstate importance and align with USGS priorities. On behalf of the USGS, I thank the committee for its interest in the USGS water programs and appreciate the opportunity to testify today. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Klein. The chair now recognizes Mr. Girton to testify for five minutes. Welcome. Good morning, Chairman Huffman, Ranking Member Bentz, and members of the subcommittee. I'm Steve Girton, Deputy Director for Policy for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on our budget request for fiscal year 2022. We appreciate your continued support of the service work. For more than 150 years, the service has worked closely with partners to conserve, protect, and enhance fish, wildlife, and plants and their habitats for the continuing benefit of the American people. Our work is more important now than ever as our nation's people and natural resources face drought and fire, other climatic changes, a global pandemic, and many other unprecedented threats. Our proposed budget would provide funding to help us better accomplish our mission in a changing world and recognizes the service potential to build a brighter future for fish, wildlife, and people. Our fiscal year 22 request includes $1.9 billion in current appropriations for the service. This reflects a $331 million increase over the 21 enacted level, the largest proposed budget increase in the service's history. Our budget also includes $1.6 billion in permanent funding, most of which is proportioned to the states and territories to support their fish and wildlife conservation and outdoor recreation programs. The President's budget recognizes the service's key role in supporting the administration's top priorities, the intersecting challenges of climate change, COVID-19 pandemic, economic recovery, and racial justice. There are targeted investments to advance climate mitigation, adaptation, and resilient efforts throughout the entire agency, to prevent future pandemics associated with zoonotic disease, to create new jobs, infrastructure, and recreational opportunities, and to enhance equity in all the services and recreational experiences we provide and promote agency-wide. I'll summarize and highlight some of these ways in which the budget request addresses these critical priorities. Most of the request and the service work maintains and increases conservation efforts and helps address the climate crisis. Across service programs, there's a total increase of about 240 million above the 21 enacted level for programs and projects that will contribute to minimizing the negative effects of climate change, bolster community resilience, and increase carbon sequestration. This also supports economic activity and creates jobs, and it provides key support for the America Beautiful Initiative, which aims to conserve 30% of U.S. land and water by 2030 through investments in partner programs, climate science, and habitat adaptation and resilience. Additional funding will be used to support land management and restoration while creating job opportunities for Americans in the outdoors, including $585 million in funding for the operations and maintenance needs across 568 national wildlife refuges. This is an increase of almost $81 million above 21 levels. Addressing the deferred maintenance backlog is critical to our long-term investment in America's treasured public lands and also creates jobs. Our budget includes $49 million for deferred maintenance at our refuges. And in addition, there's a $31 million investment that almost doubles funding for deferred maintenance at our national fish hatchery system. Budget requests $35 million for climate science, an almost two-fold increase over last year. This is needed to guide expanded use of clean energy sources and improve resilience to changing temperatures, water levels, and weather patterns resulting from climate change. Our work supports the responsible development of clean energy sources to create new industries, support American workers while reducing emissions that contribute to climate change. With a request of $28 million, the budget more than doubles funding for service activities associated with clean energy development. This includes a key increase for $8 million for our ecological services program for planning and consultation to support reviews and permitting of clean energy projects. There's also a corollary increase of $5.1 million for our migratory bird management program to support clean energy permitting and increase renewable resource development 
while protecting migrating birds, including bald and golden eagles. Finally, we're requesting 1.4 million as part of a Department of the Interior-wide diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility budget initiative. In addition to supporting administration priorities, our budget will ensure and restore and enhance capacity across the services programs, building our conservation workforce and enhancing our ability to implement the laws that direct our conservation mission on behalf of the American public. We've provided programmatic budget highlights in our written testimony. We thank you for the opportunity to testify today and for your interest in the services 2022 budget request. We'd be pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gerton. The chair now recognizes Dr. Spinrad to testify for five minutes. Good morning, Chairman Huffman, Ranking Member Bentz, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the President's FY 2022 budget request for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA. My name is Rick Spinrad, and I serve as the Undersecretary of the Atmosphere and NOAA Administrator. After spending much of my career in NOAA leadership roles, I'm grateful to return, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to our and future investments to enhance crops and services for all of our. For fiscal year 2022, NOAA proposed a budget of $50 billion in disciplinary operations, an increase of just over $1.5 billion from fiscal year 2021 enacted. This budget would support NOAA's goal of scaling up efforts to understand and mitigate the impact of the climate crisis. Specifically, NOAA investments in research, observations, forecasting, operation and resilience, offshore wind development, and equity at NOAA, as well as through our programs that touch everyday lives and livelihoods. It also includes additional investments in fleet support satellites, space weather observations and predictions to ensure NOAA can use to provide the information needed to protect critical infrastructure and aeronautic national security. NOAA's fiscal year 2022 budget reflects my duties as administrator, which build on NOAA's long history of success and meet the needs of the future by expanding, diversifying, and enhancing products and services for all Americans, to ensure that NOAA builds economic opportunities in the and upholds our critical role of environmental stewardship, and to position NOAA to take an aggressive and active role in diversifying the federal workforce and the general STEM community in a just, equitable and inclusive manner. To that end, I am announcing today the establishment of the NOAA Climate Council, comprised of the agency's top leadership, charged with identifying, developing, and improving the delivery of the climate products and services that communities across our nation need the most. Part of this effort will focus on strengthening and galvanizing the relationship of NOAA with the other federal agencies, so, such as those joining me today on the panel, the private sector, academia, non-governmental organizations, and philanthropy. Our proposed budget takes great stride toward ensuring that NOAA's authoritative climate products and services are deployed effectively to help all Americans mitigate, adapt to, and become more risk against climate change. The country are struggling with the effects of extreme climate, weather, and events like hurricanes, floods, droughts, wildfires, and fisheries collapse. In fact, as I sit here in my home in Oregon, as a constituent of yours, Congressman Bentz, there are nine large uncontained fires ravaging through acres of forest. The 2020 wildfire season was a devastating example of the environmental and socioeconomic destruction that events can wreak on communities, businesses, and the environment. There's an increasing need for NOAA's science and services, and we must be able to meet the needs of all, all communities. For over 50 years, NOAA's provided science, service, and stewardship to the nation. NOAA leverages diverse authorities for climate, weather, fisheries, coasts, and the ocean to develop and deliver the most knowledge and actionable products to meet the needs of decision makers. Through these additional investments across NOAA's mission, we will be on track to deliver and develop new and improved climate tools and products that provide useful information and services to communities, businesses, and the public. 
For example, our funding requests would provide critical investments to forecast to better predict fire behavior. In addition, new improvements in engagement with tribal nations and at-risk communities related to drought forecast documentation and mitigation strategies. Our funding requests would increase fishery surveys, sampling, and analysis capabilities to deliver information on the distribution and abundance of valuable term and best management strategies. And finally, it would allow NOAA to continue to invest in ecological restoration and community resilience. NOAA provides the nation's authoritative climate and environmental services, and this budget request would enable us to understand, prepare for, and adapt to the changes that we're already seeing and those that are yet to come. I look forward to working closely with you as we develop our science and services in fiscal year 2022 and beyond, and I look forward to discussing NOAA's mission more with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spinrad, and thank you for helping make the case for improved rural broadband investments. Um, I'm glad we have your full written testimony because uh, the audio version was heavily redacted because of a bad connection. Uh, I don't know if you're able to work on um, a different connection before we uh, get to questions, but if there is a way to do that, it'll make things go more smoothly. I think our USGS um, witness had a similarly sketchy connection. So it is what it is. Uh, we're gonna now bring it back to the, the members uh, for questions. Let me remind members that committee rule 3D imposes a five minute limit on questions. The chair will now recognize members for any questions they may want to ask the witnesses. And we'll begin with the ranking member, uh, sorry, with the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Grijalva. Not, not too many questions, Chairman Hoffman, and, and thank you very much for this hearing. I really uh, appreciated the testimony and, and, and the timing of this hearing, and, and thank you very much. And I think your opening comments it stated the, uh, at least the majority's opinion on, on, on the Resources Committee going forward, and, and I appreciate that. Can't say it any better. Uh, but one of the witnesses talked about a changing world, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and I couldn't agree more. And there was also discussion about being preoccupied with uh, undoing what the Trump administration did in these agencies and in, in, in the areas of our jurisdiction of the committee. Well, you know, part of uh, part of a changing world is uh, is just that undoing some of the priorities and the policies and the practices that had been in place for uh, for years. And that's about moving forward. I appreciate the investments. Uh, the one point question I have is uh, for uh, the, the commissioner of, of the Bureau of Reclamation and for uh, Dr. Klein. Uh, extreme weather uh, conditions caused by uh, the climate crisis, uh, the mega drought in the Colorado Basin states, Arizona being one of them. And, uh, and do you feel that what the investments that we're talking about in dealing with, with these extreme weather, I, there's the long term that I couldn't agree with more, and it's reflected in the budget about how we build sustainability, but there's also the, the, the urgency, as, uh, as the chairman also pointed out, to the short term, uh, the now. Uh, do you think there's enough investment within the, the budgets that you're proposing to deal with this extreme weather, and particularly in the basin, the Colorado Basin, uh, is there any need to accelerate uh, the process that under uh, DCP uh, to have the states begin to collaborate and get together and begin to, to plan in a much more regional way than that, that's being done now? So those two questions for either or, I think, beginning with the commissioner, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman, and thank you. Mr. Palumbo. Uh, th thank you, Chairman. Uh, I appreciate the question. Uh, with respect to the lower Colorado River Basin and our drought contingency plans, we do have full funding in there to implement those plans, and we're very fortunate that we came to an agreement and those plans that are currently being implemented. With Arizona contributing along with Nevada and the country of Mexico to water scarcity plans, the $50 million we have in the budget for 2022 uh, we believe is sufficient to implement those plans. We're, at the same time, we're currently looking at other opportunities as well as uh, in the lower basin, uh, in the upper basin as well, I should say, uh, ways in which to responsibly manage the water that we do have. And we have funding for that activity as well, encompassing the entire 
Colorado River Basin. So I'm comfortable with what we have in the budget. If there were additional funding, we do have resources to put that to work, um, but we're comfortable with where our budget proposal is today. Mr. Chairman, did you have any follow-up? No, I, I yield back. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate it very much. I thank the chair, and uh, we'll now recognize Ranking Member Westerman for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses. Uh, Mr. Gurdon, the Smoky Project on the Mendocino National Forest is an example of how litigation and critical habitat designations can interfere with much-needed forest restoration activities. The Smoky Project was designated by the Forest Service to reduce wildfire risk, particularly in the Buttermilk Lake Successional Reserve, which is important habitat for the owl. Unfortunately, this project was held up in court starting in 2013 and was not resolved until 2019. Also, unfortunately, last fall, the August fire impacted the entirety of the Smoky Project, devastating thousands of acres of habitat for the owl. I fear that the services move to largely restore the expansive 2012 critical habitat designation will only serve to stop more important projects like this and will harm the owl. I also know that there's been some very successful owl habitat restoration projects on private land in the Pacific Northwest. And finally, I was uh, fortunate to be out in Mr. Huffman's district hiking in the uh, Redwood State and National Forest a couple of years ago and uh, saw a spotted owl nest, uh, but to our surprise, it was a barred owl that flew out of the nest. And I know uh, Fish and Wildlife has programs that when they've actually been uh, taking barred owls to try to Im improve the chances of survival for the spotted owl. Can, can you just give us a, kind of a rundown of what the agency's plans are for the spotted owl and how you're incorporating actual real habitat management into that, obstacles you're facing, and you know how we can do things to maybe mimic what's happening on private land where we've seen some successful owl habit restoration. Sure, thank you for your question very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have a lot of interest in working with local communities, the other federal agencies, private landowners, as we collectively navigate the challenges up in that geography. You point out the barred owl, which has emerged as a pretty severe threat to northern spotted owl survivability. We're doing a lot of aggressive work to try to uh, get them out of that territory up there. Uh, but we also have to look at the underlying habitat needs of the species. And you're correct, the administration has uh, re-looked at the designation of critical habitat up there in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we're working to get that up, out for public comment and review, but our emerging vision of that, because it's a threatened species, will still allow us to do a lot of work for fuels management, for timber management, and, and other uh, projects going on within the geography up there. So it's very much an ongoing issue and process. We're glad to work with you and your key staff and other leaders up here, keep you apprised as we work through these challenges. And of course, this is all overlaid with the drought and with fire and other challenges on the landscape. But the administration, the department, and the Fish and Wildlife Service are committed to working on a collaborative approach to uh, get us all through uh, these challenges. Thank you for your question, sir. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Palumbo, I want to shift to water storage. Uh, it's obviously an important part of preparing for any future drought. When is reclamation submitting more storage funding requests uh, to Congress under the WIN Act. Thank you for your question, Ranking Member. We are currently in the final stages of developing our plan. Uh, it's going through uh, the department, and I expect to, that Congress will see that in the next coming weeks. So um, that's good news that that will happen soon. There, there was a surplus of water only two years ago when California experienced one of the wettest winters in its history. Uh, what would be the differences in drought impact this year had some of the Wind Act storage and conveyance projects actually been built? Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a great question. It's, uh, it's, it's complicated. It's a function of where that storage would have been located and when that storage would have been available to receive water. Uh, 
absolutely storage is critical, whether it's new storage, off-stream storage, uh, augmented storage, uh, underground storage. Uh, it all adds to Reclamation's operational flexibility and provides benefits to manage water resources more tightly, especially in a year like this when we need cold water for species, we need water for agriculture, we need water for domestic purposes. So, so that operational... Wouldn't it be fair to say we would be in a better position had some of that storage been built? And, you know, especially when we look at, at Shasta, had it been raised as planned, how would the water year look? Right. I would just generally say enhanced storage does provide flexibility, and this particular year we would have been able to use that enhanced flexibility to provide water for species and water for people. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The chair now uh, recognizes uh, Ms. Napolitano for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Hello, Mr. Palumbo. Good to meet you. Uh, I'm focusing on three things. Uh, first, the Colorado River Basin that has two decades of drought. And uh, uh, do you agree that expands federal support for recycling projects, especially large-scale ones, can help provide uh, greater water security for communities in the basin? Number two, this year's budget request inadequately funds Title 16 water uh, several, and several important water smart projects. Uh, expecting Congress to plus it up. If Congress does plus it up, uh, the, would you agree that it'll help advance projects that increase drought resilience? And the third, a lot of universities and uh, other agencies, in, especially in California, have been doing a lot of groundbreaking and innovative research on how to manage drought cycles or how to address them. Um, the, can you discuss some of the relationships you have with the universities and how you share information, sir? Thank you, Congresswoman. Uh, a few things. With respect to your first question uh, regarding water recycling and desalinization as well, water purification, uh, we have an all of the above strategy and reclamation. I mentioned storage earlier, but also uh, what, using new water sources such as those provided by uh, water recycling, water purification, desalinization is key in our portfolio to manage every drop the most responsible way we can. So uh, absolutely. Uh, with respect to funding for Title 16 projects, Reclamation does have capability and capacity to execute that funding and additional uh, uh, Title 16 projects, water reuse projects, uh, as with respect to question one, does provide additional benefit uh, for the ecosystem at large uh, and for people and food and fiber production. Uh, and finally, with respect to our relationship with universities, Reclamation has a science and technology program, a research and development program. We partner with universities across the United States, uh, from New York to California. Uh, we've had great history of working with universities in California, uh, and we continue that relationship uh, we have a variety of grants uh, currently being executed in the research and development area for water purification uh, in California as well as other universities in the United States, and we benefit from that relationship greatly. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Dr. Klein, in uh, 2009, Congress directed USGS to operate uh, 4,700 uh, federal, federal priority stream gauges within 10 years, but Today, it is well short of meeting the directive largely because of insufficient funding. Um, the president budget estimates USGS will have to discontinue up to 29 this year and 58 next year because they don't have non-federal non partners. Can you uh, tell the committee what level of funding is needed to meet the directive and to make the fair, all federal priority sting gauges operation next five years and would making all federal string gauges Federal stream gauges operation may enhance our nation's drought resiliency. Yeah. Yes, thank you for the question. We estimate that it would take $238 million to fully fund all of the federal priority stream gauges. Today, about a third of the 4,700 gauges are fully funded by, the, by federal appropriated dollars. The rest rely on partnered funds. And as you say, there's a risk of, uh, as partners shift to other priorities, 
of losing some of those gauges, and that's the case uh, in this year and next year with a number of gauges uh, at risk uh, due to uh, flat funding and inflation costs. But how critical are they? How critical are the string gauges to your ability to uh, gauge? Um, they are extremely critical. In fact, we are revisiting the criteria that we used 20 years ago to identify what priorities are. For example, we have uh, over about 760 string gauges that have over 100 years of record, which make them a critical climate uh, uh, variable uh, in the United States, one of the oldest variables that we've got. Um, only uh, about 590 or so of those uh, are actually on the federal priority string gauge list. 20 years ago, we weren't using criteria such as climate change to identify priorities. So uh, we started a study this year that will conclude next year to reevaluate what, what, what criteria should be used to define federal priorities. Without those kind of data, you can't plan and prepare for drought resilience. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Ranking Member Benz. The gentlewoman from uh, New Mexico, Ms. Harrell, be allowed to sit on the dais and participate in today's hearing. Without objection. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Gerton, yesterday the service announced that they will be rescinding the last administration's northern spotted owl critical habitat rule. This announcement is being made while severe cataclysmic, environmentally devastating, and community devastating wildfires continue to ravage the west and torch spotted owl habitat last year. Severe wildfires burned over 360,000 acres of suitable nesting and roosting spotted owl habitat in Oregon alone. These fires are the results of millions upon millions of acres of federal lands becoming unforgivably overstocked due to the last lack of forest restoration activity. Increasing critical habitat for the owl only stands to tie up more of these projects and litigation resulting in thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of more acres being burned up, less owls and of course less jobs in a 2020 species status assessment issued by the Fish and Wildlife Service highlighted this concern, noting that the most pressing threats to the northern spotted owl are invasive barred owls and wildland fire. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, you can see Oregon right now by simply looking out the window or what used to be part of it. Um, how will your, by virtue of the smoke that's coming from those hundreds of thousands of acres of fires ongoing as we speak, how will your action to rescind the last administration's rule help improve our forest's condition? Thank you for your question, Chairman. Uh, there's a lot going on in the West with fires, the bootleg fire, but there are uh, 47 other fires as well. There's about 19,000 personnel deployed, including 550 from the Fish and Wildlife Service. So the agencies are all in to help out our communities. Uh, the administration uh, has issued its uh, intent to revise critical habitat for the northern spotted owl. We believe that it involves a combination of control of the invasive barred owl, as well as a lot of habitat restoration measures. However, our, our planning also supports a very robust fuels treatment, as well as timber management program. So we'll work with the action agencies, local communities, and others to uh, come up with a common sense way to get the communities through this. Uh, thank you for your answer. And, and just a comment, uh, there's a million acres being taken out of the space that yes. would have been managed. So I, I question whether or not uh, we'll actually see some activity, which is desperately needed. And I would remind everybody, we have about 30 million acres of forest in Oregon alone. And uh, these, these acres need attention or you'll just be seeing more of them passing over the top of Washington, DC. So Mr. Palumbo, I have asked this question to every interior witness and have yet to get a decent answer. In April, the administration announced the launch of a, launch of a drought relief working group yet there are still very few details available. The drought is horrific, and I, I don't know how words can convey the, the damage that's being done to communities and people as their wells dry up and they have to bring in tanks of water. Uh, this is happening over and over and over again across all of the Western United States. Uh, where is this working group? I understand it might have met. If so, we haven't heard much about it, and can we anticipate any uh, effort by this administration to address what is an incredibly challenging situation for 70 million people. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member, for your question and, and your um, right on the, the working group, drought working group has met. Uh, information has been conveyed down to each of the bureaus on objectives, 
Uh, I wake up every morning and go to bed every night thinking about the drought. We talk about Klamath every day. We talk about the West every day. Um, we are standing up a variety of activities, working with other agencies, uh, NOAA, uh, USDA, ways in which we can bring relief, leverage each other's resources. Uh, those are active discussions. Uh, we are looking at actionable uh, results. Um, and uh, working with, again, the Drought Resiliency Partnership as a result of the working group, working with the Water Subcabinet as, as a result from direction from the Drought Working Group. So things are happening, and um, it, we are looking at actionable things that can be done to mitigate and to adapt. Thank you. And Dr. Spinrad, uh, there has been a conflict between the needs of the salmon in the Klamath River on the one hand and the, uh, the birds in the refuges across the Klamath Basin. The salmon won and the birds are now put at risk of dying by the hundreds of thousands. How would you suggest this nation address the co competition now between uh, endangered species uh, given uh, the nature of our uh, single purpose Endangered Species Act? Dr. Spinrad, you can go ahead and answer. Thank you. I assume my audio has improved from what it was during my oral statement. Uh, and so thank you again, Ranking Member Pence. The uh, issue is uh, based on the best science that we can bring to the discussion. From the NOAA perspective with regard to our uh, regulatory responsibilities associated with salmon coho, as you, as you indicated in your statement, uh, we work to make sure that the best information is available for assessing the uh, sustainability of that stock. And I would point out that when we talk about scientific information, for example, it is not just the volume of flow associated with release of water from dams, but the temperature of that water, for example, dramatically affects the, the survivability of those uh, juvenile salmon in the stream. So through the interagency coordination of the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House, we have the venues for having those discussions about the relative puts and takes, if you will, for the science that supports the sustainability of the fish stocks as well as the uh, other implications on fish and wildlife. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I yield back. Thank you very much. And, and uh, the news that salmon are big winners in the Klamath Basin will come as a great surprise to the fishing communities I represent downstream. Uh, but with that, I want to recognize uh, Mr. Case for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to each and all of you for your, for your service and your, your, your partnership. Um, and um, I, I agree, this is a good, good solid budget that, that um, uh, responds to the uh, times that we are living in, especially on the climate change uh, side, uh, certainly in, in our House Appropriations Committee, where I'm also privileged to serve, um, to include this, the Commerce Science Justice Subcommittee, which has jurisdiction over at least NOAA and number of the other agencies we've tried to act on this budget. So um, refining the budget, uh, refining the, the initiatives, I think is uh, valuable. I want to just uh, spend a little bit of time uh, more driving a few points home in defense of the parts of our country that are not part of the continental United States. Um, because um, one of you made the comment on states west of the 100th meridian, and I paused for a second to think, okay, did they mean Hawaii as well? Uh, and um, obviously we are west of the 100th meridian, but the point I wanna make is that many of the um, um, national policies to include budgets and funding and focus of these programs often tend to focus on the, really the issues of the western continental um, United States. And of course, we have a lot of parts of this country that are not, not the continental United States in general, nor are they part of the West. Um, and there are a lot of misconceptions that often flow out of that mindset um, that, that, um, that, that you know, people like me always have to kind of correct. And, and so I would encourage broader thinking there. And I would just uh, make a couple of observations to, to, to make the point. Um, uh, in the Bureau of Reclamation, for example, you spoke to the importance of the Bureau in, 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 in water projects. Okay, well, those are the big rivers and the big dams and the big reservoirs and the big distribution systems. We don't do that in Hawaii, nor does Puerto Rico do that, or nor does Guam do that, nor does the Virgin Islands, nor does Samoa. We function on a different model. Uh, we function on a model of watershed. 20% of Hawaii is, is watershed. And that watershed captures the water and filters it down into aquifers, and we use those aquifers for our water, critical water. 
We don't get to divert water from one state to the other. We don't have Colorado River diversion uh, discussions. We've just got what we got. And so uh, the Bureau of Reclamation, when, when, you, when you administer, for example, your water smart you know, program, it's, it's, it, I think it's valuable to, for you to always think about, hey, there's other ways that states and territories are dealing with, with, with water issues. Uh, so that would be kind of one, one example. Um, another example uh, would be uh, many of the programs having to do with invasive uh, uh, and critical species. Um, now, uh, Fish and Wildlife and USGS both have a piece of this, and uh, we appreciate the attention to our particular problems, but sometimes people do forget um, that when you're sitting on an island, uh, the, 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 the issues around uh, dealing with invasive species and, and critical habitats are different uh, from, the, from the Western United States. So you're in your own little ecosystem, um, and that ecosystem has developed over a long period of time, and it is highly fragile. Um, it is different from the Western, or for that matter, anywhere else in the continental U.S. ecosystem, and it, is, it can be affected very negatively very fast from invasive species coming in. So the mechanisms that are available uh, should be thought about and, and utilized a little bit more. Uh, from a NOAA perspective, uh, you know, we don't, we don't really particularly have an issue of NOAA not understanding the oceans. I mean, we're in the ocean. NOAA does world-class leading research in the oceans uh, in Hawaii. Um, if anything, the inverse is true, where perhaps, um, you know, um, there's less of an appreciation of the issues uh, in the Western United States from a, from, you know, from a, possibly from an ocean's perspective. Uh, but um, also we do world-leading research in atmospheric, in atmospheric research uh, uh, out of NOAA in, in Hawaii, which is sometimes uh, neglected in terms of the budgeting and the funding process. And then the final point I would make is um, we're talking about droughts here. Um, and of course, the Western United States is in a terrible drought west of the 100th meridian, but so is Hawaii. Um, and by the way, so are a number of the other places in our country that you wouldn't think would be drought susceptible nor drought um, 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 uh, con consequences. We, we have one of the most severe droughts we've had in, a, in our history, recorded history in Hawaii right now. Now we all think about Hawaii as being all this lush tropical rain and how could, how could Hawaii have a drought? Well, we have drought. And so sometimes that gets lost in the national discussion when we start thinking about how do we solve drought for the Western United States. We have our own drought and we need different solutions. So, so that's a long way of, of just making the comment, and there's not a question in there unless you would like to respond to my comment, that um, as you look at these programs, please think about uh, how the impact, how the, how the situation is different in different parts of the country uh, particularly uh, uh, parts of the country that are that do not fit the model of when these laws were actually enacted to start with. Um, my time is up, so I guess you don't get to comment on my on my comment. Um, but anyway, I appreciate your listening, and um, we'll we'll be happy to work with all four of you on implementing a lot of these um, um, policies in a in a in a specific way. I thank the gentleman from Hawaii. The chair now recognizes Mr. Carl for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Smith Rath, for being with us here today in front of the subcommittee. I look forward to working with you on ways to improve the management of our Gulf Coast fisheries. Hamper fisheries, and it's hurting the anglers and the local economy. Thank you. I'm so sorry. Thank you for that. Uh, there's a local economy on, on the Gulf Coast. All right, thank you. Uh, from what I've heard, I've seen that NOAA is prioritizing its own federal catch data over the mo more accurate and timely state data, ignoring congressional requirements. States on the Gulf Coast, like Alabama, have been over backwards to develop accurate monitoring systems for Red Snapper. This app we use in Alabama called the Snapper Check, collects data on real time from anglers and the estimates of harvest and the, and the management quota, which helps us manage the quota in a more efficient manner, adding more days to our anglers fishing when it can, or closing the season earlier when is needed. On the other hand, federal surveys at NOAA are asking anglers to remember how much they fish several weeks ago, or more 
important, they're being contacted and asked what they actually caught. I'm a fisherman, doctor, and trust me, that fish gets bigger as the days go along. So that, that number cannot possibly be uh, correct. In addition, the federal survey is overestimating private anglers' red snapper catch comparing to Alabama system. Last year, snapper check told us we landed about a million pounds of snapper. But the survey said, from NOAA, said that we had caught 2.5 million pounds of, uh, in that harvest. I promise you, we're harvesting at a substantial level in Alabama, a sustainable level, excuse me, sir, in Alabama. And Alabama's reef fish monitoring program and the Great Red, uh, the, the great red Snapper Count backs me up on that. But NOAA is choosing not to follow the state's science on this. The results is going to be dramatic cuts in our private anglers recreational quota. You recently told the state Senate committee that it is critical that NOAA base management decisions on best science information available. I agree with you 100% and think the science you're looking at for Alabama is incorrect. My question to you, sir. In 2018, the Modern Fish Act directed NOAA to facilitate greater incorporation of state data into the fishery management. But from what I can tell, NOAA has a long way to go. Dr. Spinrad, will you commit to working with me to ensure that the state data, like Alabama's, is better incorporated into NOAA's red snapper management as quickly as possible? Thank you, Congressman, and I really appreciate your drawing attention to this uh, critical issue. As a recreational fisherman myself here in the state of Oregon, I can certainly appreciate the perspectives of the recreational fishing community in the Gulf and specifically in Alabama. I really appreciate that you have brought up the great red snapper count because I think that represents a fundamental and important way of moving forward on getting scientifically valid and uh, useful data. As you know, the, one of the consequences of that uh, great red snapper count is that the Gulf uh, Fisheries Council has taken those data and made uh, modest uh, recommendations for increased take adjustments this year. I completely agree that we need to have a strong scientifically based decision process. I also uh, agree with you that we need to ensure that across the Gulf, across all five states, any science that is brought in, any information that is brought in, has to be carefully coordinated. It has to be carefully vetted. Uh, scientifically valid means peer-reviewed, validated science. Taking that scientific information, reviewing it, confirming it, incorporating it into the council's recommendations, and then translating that into regulatory decisions is absolutely something that I commit to. And I do look forward to working with you and ensuring that that process is enhanced and improved with sustainability and the economic benefits and recreational benefits to the uh, recreational fisher as paramount considerations. Thank you, sir. And very quickly, August the 30th, and I've sent you the invitation, the University of South Alabama Marine Biology Department will be taking 10 congressmen, and I would love for you or one of your staff members to attend. Uh, they will send down their robotics, and we will actually look at the reef fish. And we get to catch a few also, so please uh, answer me back. Let me know if you can make it or not. We'd love to have you in Alabama. Thank you, sir, and I yield back. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. The chair now recognizes uh, Dr. Lowenthal for five minutes, if he's still with us. Alan? Oh, he's still with us. He's here. All right. Thank you. And this question is for Mr. Gerton. Uh, I want to thank you and your department's work to undo the damage uh, that the last administration did to the uh, Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Additionally, a congressional budget justification calls for an increase in funding uh, for greater MBTA management, outreach, and improvements for the MBTA, and also the Bald and Golden Eagle programs. Here in Congress, uh, I will soon be introducing the Migratory Bird Protection Act. Uh, an, an act to create a general permitting program under MBTA, which will give industry greater certainty 
as well as uh, cementing the MBTA's important protection for birds. Can you speak to how these recommendations for additional funding uh, for the Migratory Bird Treaty Act uh, can enhance long-term conservation of migratory birds and how that could coincide with responsible deployment of clean energy initiatives and create greater certainty for industry? Thank you for your question. <laughs> Sound like a little echo there. Sorry about that. So, thank you for your question. We are are very interested in uh, working with you, Congressman, and syncing up your emerging legislation with uh, the service's vision to move forward. Our goal is to build efficiencies and improve clarity of regulations and further implementation under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, as well as syncing up that vision with Eagle Act protections as well for other key migratory birds. Uh, as you note. The President's budget includes an historic increase of almost 40 percent, $18 million for the line item that funds our Migratory Bird Conservation Program. That's to do the uh, rulemaking that will be needed to revise these implementing regulations. Our vision is to work very closely with all the energy sectors and other interested project proponents. And uh, this idea that you have of the general permitting uh, program is something we'd like to talk further with uh, your staff and yourself as well and try to sync up these efforts. I don't know if I should look at the camera or this thing, I'm sorry. And we'll be able to uh, go further uh, in forward with program implementation, but appreciate your question and, and we can back that up with the uh, requested funding if appropriated. I will refer you, because I have to ask a question to uh, Mr. Spinrad, but I do want to find out how this fits into the responsible deployment of clean energy initiatives. Uh, and uh, so that, that's another question which, which, I, which I will send on to you. This next part of the question is from Dr. Spinrad. This last month, we held a hearing about the disturbing chemical dump site off the coast of Catalina Island, in, which is in my district in Southern California. This area had recently been mapped through a partnership between NOAA and the Scripps Institute. Data returned and testimony given confirmed that we do not know nearly enough about the impacts of this dump site. And there may be many more just like it throughout the Pacific, Atlantic, and Gulf of Mexico. Where do you see NOAA's resources and increased budget requests supporting science to address this problem with potential catastrophic impacts to the surrounding ecosystems and economies which rely upon them? Thank you, Congressman, for that question. Uh, we are very focused on this uh, Southern California dump site, uh, working obviously very closely with our colleagues at EPA. Uh, directly addressing your question, I would point out that there are three equities, if you will, at NOAA that bear on uh, solving this important problem. One is our uh, responsibility for mapping and charting. The National Ocean Service uh, does map the U.S. coast, obviously the advanced technologies that they're bringing to bear to find out where uh, the disposal site extends and, and what it's made of is part of that. The second equity, I would say, is in our Office of Response and Restoration in terms of being able to help characterize where any materials might be transported and in what concentrations. And the third equity I'd uh, bring to the table is uh, our uh, uh, abundant research on impacts on ecosystems of, uh, of various pollutants, which we conduct in very close coordination with our EPA colleagues. So we are bringing those equities to bear on this issue and consider it a very important problem. Thank you. And before I yield back, I just want to say we will follow up with you to find out. We've now identified, because of Scripps' work and your work, this site and the whole off the Southern California coast. But potentially, there could be many other sites there. And I would like to follow up with you how we're going to identify those future sites. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Dr. Lowenthal. We're, we're all very interested in that. 
Uh, the chair now recognizes Mr. Graves for five minutes of questions on Red Snapper. I, sorry, or any other subject. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure there's nothing else, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, thank you very much, and I want to thank the witnesses for being here today. First of all, um, I totally agree with Mr. Uh, Carl's line of questioning and his statements. Um, there's no possible way that folks in Alabama caught two and a half uh, million pounds of bed snapper. I've seen those people fish. I, 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 I can't believe they catch anything. I mean, they, they, they tie their hooks on like they tie their shoes. Um, they, they don't know how to cast. It's, it's, it's disgusting. And so there's no way that they've caught two and a half million pounds. Um, so Mr. Carl, just want to get you back there. Um, so more importantly, uh, Dr. Dr. Spinrad, um, I, I actually do want to talk about fisheries and, and the modern fish act, which is legislation that we, we drafted uh, was signed into law by the, by the president, and um, it, it, it was the first law that has ever been passed that actually is solely dedicated to the management of recreational species. As you know, uh, the fisheries management has largely been focused on uh, commercial fisheries, and, and I think that it was believed that recreational fishing didn't put a big enough dent in the overall uh, harvest, and so it... it, it uh, wasn't really considered. It was more uh, viewed as being a rounding error. Um, you know, the idea was is this is supposed to improve and do a better job balancing recreational commercial fisheries management, but the implementation of that law has been dragging a bit, and there are components of it that you all have implemented, the components that you've not. Uh, could you just quickly give me a rundown on y'all's implementation strategy there and when you think you'll have that fully implemented and incorporated? Thank you, Congressman. So uh, I do want to get back to you with a more detailed uh, answer uh, as to exactly what steps are being taken. I will share with you that in the course of my uh, steep learning curve at NOAA as the new administrator, I have made specific requests to get information on uh, the recre recreational fishing, fishing monitoring activities uh, and tracking and basically the accounting efforts that our National Marine Fisheries Service is undertaking. So I will commit to you to get back with a more detailed description of the steps we are taking. Well, if, if, so thank you, Dr. Mann. Like I understand wrapping up and, and drinking with fire hose. Um, so one other thing on, on that. If you could also get back to us on how the the budget that was prepared uh, for 22, how it effectively reflects the changes in law that the Modern Fish Act um, require, and how you know that sort of changes NOAA's mission to some degree, um, you know, ultimately focused on on, on healthy healthy fisheries management. Um, we good there. Yes, sir, absolutely. Okay. I, I, I will simply add that one of the tenets that I'm trying to make sure we uphold strongly uh, during my uh, uh, tenure as administrator is engagement with the respective communities. We have a long history of doing that. Uh, it's clear to me that there's, there's actually never enough of that kind of engagement, whether it's through Sea Grant or through our work with the council. And so part of the answer to your question is going to be exploiting all of the engagement opportunities that we have with the recreational fishing community. Great, great. Thank you. Um, so the next question, uh, and, and, and I apologize for doubling up on you, um, but I, I did want to ask about Great Red Snapper Count. Um, uh, you know, first of all, I, I think that it's, it's, if you look at the history of the Great Red Snapper Count, 80 independent uh, scientists, academia involved from universities across the Gulf. Uh, one of the real revelations there is that there was a, a pretty significant population of snapper in habitat that was previously not believed to really be a, a real base for red snapper. It's certainly not a place that I fish um, when I go red snapper fishing. Um, but, but this was a very robust effort, I think, hands down, the most robust effort uh, to, to try to quantify the stock. Um, based on, on what we've seen, and you did re re uh, respond to Mr. Carl about how uh, the, the, the Fisheries Council has, has changed some of their proposals on management structure, but uh, do you believe that, that that is the best science that's available right now as compared to MWIP and other products? Yeah, so um, I, I've got to say, as an aside, as a scientist, I was fascinated with some of those findings myself. Uh, it, it only serves to exemplify just how 
uh, how much there is to learn about the uh, deep sea environment. But given that, uh, the next step, again, as a scientist, is to ensure that the findings, the results are really verified, validated, run through the ringer in terms of credibility, in terms of peer review. So, um, and begging the question of how we can use new technology, because a lot of that was done with technologies we had not applied before to traditional uh, fisheries management. So, I am eager to see how that does pan out in the scientific review. And I look forward to, to your response. I want to thank you very much. I just make note that I'm not sure that MREP has been through that same scrutiny, but um, but thank you very much. I look forward to hearing back from you. You're back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Graves. The chair now recognizes the newest member of the committee, gentlelady from New Mexico, Ms. Stansbury. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the ranking member for convening today's important panel on our water resources. And I also want to say thank you to our agency leadership for your service to our country and keeping our waters flowing across the U.S. As we all know, there is nothing more precious in the West than water, which is why in my home state of New Mexico, we say la agua es vida, water is life. And that is why I have also spent my career working on water resources and resilience issues. Like much of the West, New Mexico is in the grips of an extreme drought and what I would describe as a threefold water crisis. The first is the climate crisis and drought, which is resulting, as we've heard today, from dwindling water supplies, low snowpack, and increasingly irregular precipitation patterns that are threatening our water supplies and our infrastructure. The second crisis is what I would call a long-standing humanitarian crisis, which is the lack of clean, safe drinking water in so many of our tribal communities, which came to a head during the pandemic this last year, especially in our Diné Navajo communities, where we still have thousands of households that do not have safe drinking water. It is unconscionable in this century that we still have communities and families across the Navajo Nation and other tribal communities that do not have access to safe drinking water, which impacts every facet of life from day-to-day -day life to our local economies. In my own district, the, to the Tohajali chapter and community has fought for years to get safe drinking water infrastructure and we must absolutely address this crisis now. The federal government has not upheld its trust responsibilities to our tribal communities to ensure that they have access to safe drinking water and that their water rights are protected. Finally, our third water crisis is the status of our infrastructure and ecosystems. We need significant investments in our crumbling dams, irrigation infrastructure, acequias, and the restoration of our precious ecosystems. We need investment in resilient infrastructure and green infrastructure. And we need to ensure, which will take our work here in Congress, that we change the operations of our water management systems to take climate change into consideration. Addressing this threefold water crisis requires action now. The deployment of the best science and tools available working collaboratively with and uplifting our communities to develop innovative solutions and new ways of thinking about and doing things that take climate change into consideration. Which is why I am excited and heartened to see the budgets of these agencies make a sustained commitment and restoration of science to its rightful place in informing our decision making of ensuring that climate is at the heart of how we think about the management of our water resources and that we invest in our communities. I wanna ask Mr. Palumbo, thank you for being here today. It's good to see so many good friends. Um, if you could please speak more today about the significant funding increases that are in the president's budget for tribal water resource programs and the mandatory proposal for Indian water rights. Thank you very much, Congresswoman, and congratulations. Um, with respect to Reclamation's discretionary budget, we have $157 million in our budget to advance tribal water right initiatives that are critically important and uh, top priority for the administration 
couldn't agree more, universal clean water access to tribal communities is fundamental. Um, we also have an additional $20 million we put in the budget to provide technical assistance to tribes to advance their individual settlement activities, uh, settlement activity or activities that are, are not related to settlements as well. So we're bumping up the budget in those two areas. With respect to a move to mandatory funding for Indian water rights settlements, that would be very valuable to reclamation in terms of construction, efficiency, and planning. Year after year, if that we know that funding is going to be there, we can execute the projects more timely, take advantage of price guarantees with contractors, and get that water, those molecules of water, delivered uh, to those people who desperately need it uh, in an expeditious manner. Thank you, Mr. Palumbo. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to emphasize to our colleagues that we have a tremendous opportunity with the budget infrastructure and reconciliation processes that are happening now to make an investment in water and in our communities. And the time is now. We need to make these investments. We need to invest in our communities and ensure that they have access to clean, safe drinking water. Thank you. I thank the gentlelady. Chair now recognizes Ms. Radawagon for five minutes. Talo Falaba. Thank you, Chairman Huffman and Ranking Member Bentz for holding this budget hearing today. Thank you to the panel for your testimony. Dr. Spinrad, about two months ago, American Samoa Governor Limanu Maunga sent a letter to Acting Assistant Administrator Paul Doremus regarding additional federal regulation for coral critical habitat that are already protected under American Samoa law. While I'm sure we're all on the same side of safeguarding our natural resources, Governor Lemanu expressed concerns that the proposed designated area covers a large area of coral reef habitat and does not reflect the critical habitat of threatened corals and that it is actually redundant with other local and federal regulations. How does NOAA intend to build a more efficient relationship with state and territorial authorities, and how do you intend to account for their local autonomy when it comes to preservation efforts? And if I have enough time left, I want to extend that same question to the other witnesses. What I want to know, basically, is how does the administration intend to address redundancies between federal and local action? Dr. Spinner. So, thank you, Dr. Spoon. Yes, I understand. Um, I think there are a few aspects of addressing the redundancies you alluded to. Uh, one is in looking at uh, consistency of uh, state and territory actions with coastal management plans, coastal zone management. Uh, the other uh, two elements that I would involve clearly, as I've stated repeatedly here today, is engagement. Uh, and um, the extent to which there is any discussion beyond between the governor and the assistant administrator for National Marine Fisheries uh, has to incorporate local communities. It has to incorporate uh, 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 Pacific Island Fisheries Councils. Uh, and then uh, the last piece is the scientific basis for making these decisions, incorporating as well some of the traditional ecological knowledge. So those are the keystones, I believe, in addressing potential uh, redundancies or conflicts, I would add. Any of the other witnesses? Congresswoman, uh, there were a lot of questions earlier in the hearing from leadership about the America the Beautiful or 30 by 30 initiative that could be viewed as potential uh, redundancy or overlap. Uh, the way our agency is approaching it, we're turning to our existing partnerships, uh, groups like Partnerscapes and the National Fish Habitat Partnership Board, others, a lot of the work we're already doing with private landowners. This uh, is already under conservation protection measures and things like that. There's no interest in going out and doing a, quote, federal land grab or things like that. The vision behind America the Beautiful is look to these existing partnerships, leverage them, build capacity, work at a local scale with our partners, ranchers, hunters, and also uh, continue the administration's uh, emphasis on access to the public lands and any land under conservation as well. And we just opened about 2.1 million acres of hunting and fishing access on our nation's national wildlife refuge system. Uh, which is historic amount of 90 refuges, one hatchery, to provide hundreds of hunting and fishing opportunities on our public land. And that's kind of what's behind this whole vision for the America the Beautiful and the 
30 by 30 initiative. It's really looking at the existing efforts underway and trying to amplify them. And the other witness, please. Thank you, Congresswoman. I'll just say as a general matter, the Bureau of Reclamation values our local relationships as an extremely important um, relationship to maintain. So with respect to redundancies, our approach is roll up our sleeves, get on the ground, whether it's virtual or in person, and figure out ways in which we can leverage, supplement, complement, avoid duplication, uh, but get things done on the ground in a, in a responsible way, again, without duplicating, but taking advantage, whether it be local authorities, local money, federal authorities or federal money, uh, doing that in a, a responsible way uh, alongside our partners is, is key from my perspective. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Thank the gentlelady. The chair now uh, will recognize uh, myself for five minutes. I'd like to begin with Mr. Palumbo uh, and ask you about the planned drought response program activities that are currently authorized under the Reclamation State's Emergency Drought Relief Act. I know in your budget justification, uh, you state that you plan to use most program funding for medium-term and long-term drought response, uh, but there's also a reference to some program funding being reserved for emergency response action. So I wonder if you could elaborate on how much funding uh, you will dedicate to emergency response uh, in the upcoming year. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, having that available reserve funding under the drought response Act is critical for reclamation. As we mentioned, we want to responsibly manage for the midterm and the long term, and we have other programs that look at that as well. Uh, with respect to reserving funding, we're nimble and flexible uh, based on the hydrologic year that uh, we're dealt uh, next year. Uh, we have the ability to deploy uh, more of that funding for emergency activities, whether like we're doing this year with the Klamath Basin getting tankage on site so we can uh, leverage domestic wells in a, in a responsible way, uh, look at ways in which there can be uh, land programs or other mitigation measures that are implemented. So we remain flexible. Uh, we have other buckets we can rely on for yeah. mid and long term if we need to use the majority of that for emergency actions next water year. All right, are, are there other buckets you can rely on as well for emergency drought response actions and even more specifically, do you need any new legal authorities in order to provide emergency short-term relief in a, in a crisis like this? From an emergency perspective, those short-terms, we don't have a lot of additional authorities or flexibilities or funding to put to those emergency measures. Where we do have additional buckets is the mid and long-term. Okay. So I would say there would be an opportunity uh, for emergency measures. I appreciate that. I want to now uh, specifically ask about the Klamath Basin. Um, some stakeholders there have recently requested short-term emergency drought funding in response to some terrible impacts that we've been discussing. My office shared that request with Reclamation. Can you give the committee a sense of where the agency is uh, with existing legal uh, authorities, what you can do with those authorities uh, as requested by the stakeholders, assuming that appropriations are provided uh, and made available by Congress? And again, are there any new legal authorities that would help you? Right. Th thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, we are currently looking at that, that request uh, with our legal team, our solicitor's office, on the flexibilities that we currently have if those uh, fundings, funding categories were plussed up, so to speak, to the levels that were requested in the letter. Uh, fairly substantial. We do believe we have authorities to get that money working on the ground fairly rapidly, uh, but we're, we're finalizing that assessment and we'll communicate with you if we need to tweak any language to make sure it's as Thank flexible you. as possible. Please do. Um, and then Reclamation recently indicated an appropriations reprogramming request was coming to assist with emergency drought response. Can you update us on the content or the timeline of that request? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, we are in the final stages, just as we are with the WIN Act, getting that uh, to Congress. We expect in the next couple of weeks you'll see that reprogramming request, a not insignificant amount of money uh, that would be used for drought uh, mitigation activities. So in the next couple of weeks, I would expect uh, you will be seeing that request. 
All right, thank you very much. Mr. Girton, I'll, I'll close with, with you, and you've been asked some questions about um, spotted owl habitat protection under the Endangered Species Act, and it, I think the suggestion is that we have to choose between uh, the fire threat to owl habitat and protecting habitat using those ESA tools. Uh, and in my district, uh, we have lost a ton of spotted owl habitat, maybe even permanently, to wildfires in recent years. So the ra ranking member Westerman is not wrong when he points that out as a, as a threat to recovery of the spotted owl. But you also said something very important I want to ask you to, to elaborate on. You said that um, exercising those ESA tools, including critical habitat, does not preclude uh, fuel load reduction and other treatments. So could you could just tell us a little bit more about why uh, that may be a bit of a false choice and, and why you can uh, use the full suite of tools under the ESA and still reduce fuels? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure, uh, agency is trying to look for solutions on the landscape. The ESA is a very powerful regulatory mechanism. It does include a lot of flexibilities and our designation of critical, our designation of critical habitat will not preclude the use of fire as a tool on the landscape. It will not preclude the use of selective uh, timber management processes as well. Uh, the vision is to work with the communities, the other federal agencies, the states, the tribes, landowners in, in the region, and, and come up with a, a landscape scale solution uh, using all the flexibilities we all know we have. All right, thank you for that. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Colorado, Ms. Bobert, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Huffman and Ranking Member Bentz for having this hearing today, and good morning to the witnesses. Thank you so much for testifying here. Uh, it is totally unacceptable that the Biden regime's budget was released months behind schedule and fails to proactively address uh, the severe drought plaguing the West. The reduction in snowpack and early spring runoff makes water storage investments all the more critical in ensuring resilience of our water supply and delivery system. The Biden budget is bloated with climate goodies for the radical left, but somehow amidst its new uh, spending, it does not recommend the reauthorization of the expiring subtitle J of the Water Infrastructure Improvements for the Nation Act. Subtitle J successfully funded water storage, water recycling, and dis desalination projects throughout the West during the Trump administration. This lack of funding simply makes no sense and highlights how out of touch this regime is with the needs of millions of Americans. My first question is for Mr. Girton. Mr. Girton, it has been over a month since myself, Ranking Member Westerman, Congressional Western Caucus Chairman Dan Newhouse, and several other members of Congress sent this bicameral letter to the Department of Interior regarding the announcement to initiate a review of land management plans for the greater sage grouse. When can we expect a response to this letter from June 16th, 2021? Congresswoman, I would have to uh, track that down for you, and we can provide an update on the status of that response within the next 24 hours. I apologize uh, for your frustration for having to wait this long. Thank you very much, Mr. Durkin. Uh, and as you know, the uh, 2019, the land management plans developed by the Trump administration were supported by all the Western governors involved, including Democrats. In a call with Fish and Wildlife Service staff after your announcement, service staff committed to including these 2019 plans as a part of the review. Can you please confirm that they are part of the, of the review? I would also have to track that down for you, Congresswoman. I apologize, and we can get you a response within 24 hours. Thank you very much, Mr. Gerton. Uh, we will be looking forward to those uh, two responses. And I'd like to ask a question uh, for Mr. Palumbo. Mr. Palumbo, the Senate is currently discussing expanding the amount of funding dedicated to infrastructure, particularly water infrastructure in the Western United States. Unfortunately, this committee seems to be more focused on less relevant issues. Uh, nonetheless, 
what large scale storage and conveyance projects would reclamation prioritize to increase the reliability of water supplies? Uh, thank you, Congresswoman, for the question. The Bureau of Reclamation looks at all of its watersheds, looks at supplies, and looks at demands, and prioritizes our infrastructure investments that way. There's a variety of projects in California, uh, in Idaho, in Washington, uh, really across the West that we prioritize for infrastructure investment, whether it be new infrastructure or addressing aging infrastructure. So we have a portfolio based on risk, based on need that we can implement funding if Congress so chooses to provide it. Thank you, and I have one more question, Mr. Colombo. I know that there are current lawsuits over reclamation projects. I ask that reclamation provide the committee a list of grants awarded by reclamation to any entity that has sued them. Would you be able to provide uh, the committee and my office with that information? Uh, yes, we, we could do that. I would work with our solicitor's office uh, and our grants program to cross-reference those lists. Uh, we, we certainly could do that if so uh, asked. Thank you very much. We look forward to receiving that. I appreciate you being here today, Mr. Colombo and uh, Mr. Geerton. Thank you so much for your time and uh, for your added value to this hearing. Uh, and with that, uh, Chairman Huffman, I yield back. Thank the gentlelady. The chair now recognizes uh, the gentlelady from New Mexico, Ms. Harrell, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you uh, for hosting this committee and letting me be a part of it today. Um, and my colleague actually really outlined our challenges in New Mexico as it relates to drinking water, so I want to talk about something a little bit different. Um, we're obviously almost ground zero for the Endangered Species Act, and with this um, potential listing of the lesser prairie chicken, that'll have an adverse effect, really devastating on both our energy um, and our agricultural industries. We've spent millions of dollars, private money, uh, in, in putting together candidate conservation agreements and candidate conservation agreements with assurances in my district. So my, uh, in fact, have been so effective that we've actually doubled the number, uh, the population number of the lesser prairie chicken since 2013. So my question, uh, Mr. Gerton, would be, can you assure me and my constituents that the Fish and Wildlife Service will continue to honor the CCAs if a final rule is issued uh, listing the lesser prairie chicken? Thank you for your question, Congresswoman. Uh, we are right now have our proposed rule out for public comment. It closes uh, in early August the 2nd. We've had two virtual hearings to solicit feedback from constituents and landowners and others. Uh, we're pulling all this information together today. I can't commit to you right here at this hearing what our final agency determination will do. We have to look at all the science. I will commit to you. We'll keep the communications going with you and your office throughout that process and make sure that your constituents uh, know what we're planning to do with our final determination as well. And uh, we look forward to just keeping those lines of communication open uh, with you and your constituents, but thank you. Thank you, okay, and this, and obviously we are in the western states drought, you know, drought ridden, but we have had a good amount of moisture in the area, so um, will you be, and I think I know the answer to this, but you will be providing ample time to collect accurate information um, with the impacts that this monsoon season has had on the habitat for the lesser prairie chicken, and I'm sure the answer to that is yes. Of course, Congressman. We look at the best available science, including state of play right now in the uh, environment. We'll take all of that information in, and uh, throughout the process, uh, assure you that we'll make sure we keep the channels of communication open. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Um, Palamo, I wanted to ask, how involved is the um, Bureau with the crafting of the Ocean-Based Climate Solutions Act? We had a markup in the Natural Resources Committee last week, and obviously it had a lot to do with water, and what concerns me is the water, uh, when we speak to reservoirs, acequias, uh, irrigation canals, especially in the western states, I wanted to know how engaged and how involved the Bureau was with the crafting of that legislation and what the input might have been. Thank you. I'm going to have to get back with you on our specific involvement. I do believe we've looked at the legislation, okay. but in terms of the specifics, I don't know that. But you're absolutely keen on an important issue that uh, water and climate change are global issues and sure. circulations, whether in the ocean or atmosphere, affect what's going on in the West. 
Okay, thank you. That, that'd be great. And then just one last question, um, and this goes back to Mr. Uh, Gruton. I'm just curious and taking advantage of an opportunity to speak to you. There is an issue with a potential listing of the New Mexico meadow jumping mouse in the Lincoln National Forest. It's an issue that's been going on for really almost 20 years, um, and obviously it's it's very contentious, and it now brings into light private property rights, water, riparian areas. Are you at all familiar with that? Um, is your office involved in it? Because I know Fish and Wildlife is involved on the more local level. Thank you for your question, Congressman. I previously served as a regional director in our Denver office and worked a lot on the listing determination for the Preble's Meadow Jumping Mouse in Colorado in Wyoming. Our, our work throughout was always guided by the best available science and the uh, work we could do with private landowners, the states, tribes, and other uh, uh, users of the landscapes out there. We can get back to you with a better status update on the specifics of uh, your mouse uh, there in New Mexico. Be glad to follow up on that. Okay. But in general, that work right now would be uh, led out of our regional office in Albuquerque, and then we have an ecological services uh, field office in the state of New Mexico where the lead biologists are working on that. But again, glad to get you a status update on our work and offer to keep the lines yeah, of communications going with you and your, your leadership team on that issue as well. Thank you, and we can talk about that offline. So thank you so much, and thank you to all the witnesses for your time and your input. And Mr. Chair, thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. Mr. Whitman, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to thank our witnesses for joining us today. Mr. Gerton, um, President Biden said, don't tell me your values. Show me your budget, and I'll tell you your values. Do you agree with the President's statement? That's a take on the old uh, adage, uh, show me your checkbook and your calendar, and I'll tell you what your priorities well, are. No, yes, just, just a, just a clear, clear yes or no. Do you agree with the President's statement? Yes, sir. Okay. In the Cooperative Endangered Species Conservation Budget, which you know provides resources for states and territories to look at non-federal lands and how to really get after how we manage species, how we preserve critical habitat, I think that's, that's key. And it, and it provides the resources for localities to write habitat conservation plans, which is really how localities look at what they can do to preserve habitat, critical habitat, what they can do to make sure there's minimal impact on critical species and make sure that they avoid in Endangered Species Act listings. Pretty critical. In your budget, you have increased most every area of the budget, except you have cut this particular fund. So the agency says that it's actually your stated goal to support locally-led conservation efforts. Yet your funding says that you do not. So it's apparent to me that if you agree with the president's statement that the agency no longer values cooperation with localities. It no longer values ha habitat conservation plans. It no longer values what the agency said previously that it did. So has the agency's goal changed in that you no longer value uh, cooperative-led conservation efforts? Because that is in contradiction to your agency's stated goal. Sure, Congressman. Uh the tables I'm looking at, I believe we actually have a $12 million increase or 38% increase for the Cooperative Endangered Species Conservation Fund. I can reach out to your staff and make sure. Well, I want to see. I, to, I look at it clearly and see that, that you're not funding habitat conservation plans. You're taking money away from going to, to localities. Oh, you're talking about within the. Uh, yes. The, okay. I apologize. Yes, sir. We, we just uh, tried to prioritize within the account. Uh, that's something so, that you're, so what you're doing is prioritizing, taking away resources so that localities that have intimate knowledge about habitat preservation, about impacts on species, what you're saying is our priorities is we don't give a hoot about them anymore. We're just going to go ahead and put in a top-down uh, system where people in Washington actually are going to know better about what to do under the Endangered Species Act provisions than locality. So what you're saying is you, you really no longer value, it's really not a, a, an agency priority anymore to value locally led conservation efforts. I think the budget just came out the way it did, sir. Uh, we certainly believe in, in empowering our local community partners and, and others. Uh, we can take a look at that for the next president's budget development So, as well. So do you, in, do you empower them then by taking resources away? So what you're saying is, is if you guys want to do this, you just, just do it on your own. But 
but we're not going to do anything, especially since ESA is a federally mandated requirement. Mm -hmm. We're just going to come in and unilaterally say, the heck with you. We don't care what you think about preserving critical habitat. We don't care what you think can be done to protect these species. We're just going to do what we want, and we don't give a hoot about what you guys think. Well, there are many other increases in the administration's request there that Partners for Fish and Wildlife, our coastal programs, and others that make those similar investments. I think this well, that's, one I mean, program that's, just you, didn't You turn agreed out with, 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 with what the president said. It's clearly, it says this is what you value, so it's apparent that if you're not going to fund it, that you're not valuing it. Oh, I, I respectfully, sir, we've got a, a series of uh, increases in the budget. Most of them are directed toward partnerships and, and local communities. Uh, apologize, this one line item just shifted funding to a different level of emphasis, but our commitment to you is to always focus on these local partnerships through the NACA program, through Partners for Fish and Wildlife, Fish Passage, and other programs as well. And we can certainly take another look at future budget developments, the inner components of the Cooperative Endangered Species, Cooperative Endangered Species Conservation Fund. Well, it just seems like to me that it's an inconsistency or a contradiction if you're saying that you're in favor of locally led conservation efforts, yet you're saying, we don't care if you write habit to conservation plans, we don't really value your focus on what we do to preserve endangered species. That seems like to me to take an awfully effective tool off the table, and it creates a very much top-down approach. And, you know, you're in agreement with what the president says, and that is, you know, what you value is what you focus on in your budget. So. The association is, is that you don't value these habitat conservation plans, or there's a contradiction in what you say as the agencies focus on locally led conservation efforts. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I want to thank the witnesses for their valuable testimony and the members for their questions. The members of the committee may have some additional follow up questions for the witnesses, and we'll ask you to respond to those in writing under Committee Rule 3 0. Members of the committee must submit witness questions within three business days following the hearing, and the hearing record will be held open for 10 business days to allow for responses. If there's no further business, then without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned.